Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <clears throat> In the collection of Zen problems known as the Gateless Gate, number 38 <clears throat> goes like this. A monk asked Chao Chu why Bodhidharma came to China. Chao Chu said, an oak tree in the garden. We, uh, we looked at the last chapter that we're going to look at in the uh, Lotus Sutra, which <laughs> I didn't get around to telling everybody, okay, we're finally done with this. And we'll be starting the uh, Sutra of the Sixth Patriarch next week. Something a little less verbose. Our monk Bhattai has been overwhelmed by the verbiage in the Lotus Sutra. And the last chapter we looked at was on Dharanis. And Dharanis are long magical formulas that are recited and they're related to mantras because mantras are short magical formulas that are recited. Uh, the difference with a Dharani is very often they don't translate so well. And we always begin our meditation and end it with a mantra, which is Om Mani Padme Um, which we know the meaning of. It means hail to the jewel and the lotus, which is Kuan Yin or Quantum. Uh, <clears throat> the other, the, the Dharanis are kind of long and D.T. Suzuki wrote in one of his book of essays that he wasn't sure how they got involved with Zen. And I pointed out to uh, the people in class today that uh, years ago, uh, studying the history of Zen, there was a period of time in China when all the different schools started getting together and doing things together. And, I th and my conclusion was that's how Durrani's got into the Zen practice, is that there was this universal sharing. And so people left different traces of things in there. But Durrani's don't ch translate so well. And I went to look for a book on in our library shelf, which we should have had a couple of, which apparently somebody has walked off with. This happens on a regular basis <clears throat> and never to return. And so I need to buy a couple copies of it and put it back on the shelf, which is D.T. Suzuki's Manual of Zen Buddhism. And in there, he translates the Dai Shen Durrani, which in Vietnamese is the Chu Dai Bi. And <clears throat> it's pretty unintelligible. And very often people will say, why don't we go ahead and chant that in English? Because we do the Heart Sutra in English, we do many things in English, and we don't chant it in English because it doesn't really chant very well. If it was a song, it would never get in the top 10. It just is very awkward. But Dharanis are magic, and magic really doesn't have much place in the practice of Zen. Now, occasionally we use magic, I'm being honest with you now, when we have a difficult time uh, dealing with the everyday world. Sometimes we use a little magic to, to kind of calm ourselves down. And uh, our head monk related how uh, this worked for him, and when he was... Uh, encountered demons and whatnot in his practice. Which, by the way, if you practice sin long enough, you will encounter demons in your practice. You just may not realize they're demons. <clears throat> but that's uh, what the Buddha called them. So what's this got to do with an oak tree? Well, Bodhidharma came to China and we always say, of course, we say Bodhidharma was the founder of the Zen or Chan school in China. And that with his arrival, we officially can say, okay, this is the date. Of course, we're not sure of the date. There's a little variation, but it's, it's around the date. And he arrived, and now we have the Zen school in China. And um, a couple of years ago, we have a long retreat coming up. And I'll mention it now. Of course, I try not to date our talks, you know, so that people go, oh, he gave that talk then. Well, it's right on the website. It says when the talk was given. So 
but we have our retreat the first week of April uh, coming up where monks come in from out of state. And uh, we did that a couple years ago and someone was talking about Bodhidharma. He was giving a talk, one of the senior monks was giving a talk on martial arts and, uh, and Zen. And there is this uh, story that goes that Bodhidharma brought the martial arts to China being Kung Fu, of course, and, and that at the Shaolin Temple, which by the way, Bodhidharma never lived at the Shaolin Temple. Let me just lay that to rest. There is absolutely no historical record of him living at the Shaolin Temple. He lived in a cave down the road from the Shaolin Temple, and that's really quite different. But of course now we have these monks in China that go around pounding on each other saying, this is true Buddhism. Let me punch you in the nose. So that's another issue. But during the, the lecture, which was a wonderful <clears throat> lecture on martial arts and how it got into the practice of Zen, Bodhidharma was brought up and uh, our senior monk who was uh, giving the lecture was challenged about the historicity of Bodhidharma. I actually said that word without stumbling. I'm so proud of myself. Once in a while I do it right. And I won't try to say it again. And um, so then, then there ensued this little encounter about, well, you know, we're not really sure there was a Bodhidharma. And then another story goes, there were three Bodhidharmas. And which Bodhidharma are we talking about? And, and it just gets all involved. Well, why did Bodhidharma come from the West? The oak tree in the garden. And the oak tree in the garden uh, is um, a koan. It's a Zen problem. And if you did a retreat here and you came in to me and said, I, I really want to work on a koan because I don't seem to be making any progress doing what we're doing. I'm following my breath and that, that gets me nothing or I'm doing shikantaza, and I don't even know if I'm doing it right, but I want to work a koan, I might give you that koan. And then you would almost immediately give me an answer back, depending on how much reading you'd done. The more reading you'd done, the longer the answer would be. And, uh, you know, your answer may take half an hour, because you'd start talking about the state of Buddhism in China and what was going on, and Perhaps they were going down the wrong road at the time and Bodhidharma came from India to get back people back on the true path. And, you know, meditation really, that's, meditation is, is how the Buddha got enlightened. That's why I meditate, because uh, when I was a kid and I became a Buddhist and there was no teachers around and I, all I could do was read a book and, and it said in the book the Buddha was sitting under a tree and then doing meditation and he woke up to his true nature <clears throat> i.e., he became enlightened, therefore that's how you become a Buddha, right? Isn't that good science? Good science says that if we do an experiment and we get this result, enlightenment, then we should be able to repeat the experiment and get the same result. And if we cannot repeat the experiment, then we, we, the first time it happened doesn't count. That's good science. Good science says you can repeat the experiment and get the same result. It wasn't an accident, in other words. So if the Buddha did not become enlightened accidentally, or to put it another way, if meditation had nothing to do with his enlightenment, then we needed to do something else. Maybe we needed to starve ourselves to death, or wander around in a forest for seven years, and then finally give up and become enlightened, and the meditation had nothing to do with anything. Maybe. But what we do is we try to do good science. And what we've discovered over the years is that if you do meditation and you do it wholeheartedly and you learn about the oak tree in the garden and you stop worrying about why Bodhidharma came to, to China, who cares? Maybe he came there because he had some things he was going to sell on the market. Because we know he came on a boat. And maybe he was actually really a merchant, and he wasn't a monk at all, but he was called Bodhidharma, and everybody got confused because he looked like a monk, because he was, he'd was he gone bald in an early age. You know, he had that male pattern baldness that some men get. Who knows? Who cares? The point is the oak tree in the garden. What's going on with the oak tree? Have you ever seen an oak tree that thought it was anything but an oak tree? 
Have you ever seen a neurotic oak tree? Have you ever, have you ever seen an oak tree that thought it was special? Did you ever see an oak tree that had an inferiority complex? That's another word I normally stumble over. I'm in good, I'm doing form, good form today. As I, in my old age, I'm developing a speech impediment where I just stumble a lot. So what's the deal with the oak tree? The Vietnamese have exactly the same koan, only they say the plum tree in the courtyard. It's the same thing. Okay, can you be the plum tree? Can you be the oak tree? Can you just be who you are and not get confused if I tell you that you're very, very talented, Rob? See, Rob already knows he's very, very talented, but sometimes he doubts himself. So can I tell you that you're very, very talented without it going to your head? <laughs> you know, why do we tell people that they have talent? Just to encourage them. <clears throat> That's the only reason we tell them they have talent, to encourage them. I used to teach children. Children need to be told repeatedly they're doing okay. And why is that? Because society tells them repeatedly that they're not doing okay. That's the way society operates. Or oh, you made that mistake. Instead of focusing on what worked right, we focus on what didn't work right. Okay? So we need to become the oak tree. We were talking today about the Duranis and we were talking about sound. And I had a very good friend who passed away. And she, we would be at Buddhist events and they, we would invite people in and they would be making their cultural music. And she very often commented <clears throat> on some of these groups that, oh boy, look at the samadhi they're in. And samadhi is a technical term. It's part of the Eightfold Path. It's number eight in the Eightfold Path. And it gets translated as right concentration. But samadhi is a better word because it, samadhi is a single pointedness of mind. It isn't just, but the right is important. Because today I was saying musicians experience samadhi. And psychologists are very aware of samadhi. I've, in the past, I've two or three or four or five or half a dozen, I don't know how many times, I've talked about this whole psychology of a happy person. And, and the attributes of a happy person. I read an article 40 years ago in Parade Magazine. I never forgot it, except I forgot all the attributes. <laughs> I remember the article, but I don't remember. So I went on the internet and I looked up Parade Magazine, which you can because Parade Magazine just had its 50th anniversary because it comes in my newspaper on Sunday. <clears throat> it's not much of a magazine now, but it used to be a pretty good little magazine and they had celebrated their 50th anniversary. And I tried to look up that article because I, I was trying to remember what were the different attributes. Well, one of the attributes was, was gratitude, that happy people experience gratitude. Now, what's, what's the deal here, you're going to say? I wish Jane was here today. She could probably take it right off for him. Jane is one of our people that is a psychologist, and so she's Dr. Jane. And... Psychology and psychiatry, I assume, have started looking in the last 20, 30 years at what a happy person's like. See, a healthy person, right? Happy, healthy. Uh, before that, it was always what an unhealthy person looked like. So we had definitions of paranoid people and schizophrenic people and obsessive compulsive people. And, and uh, when I went to college and I took uh, the first class in psychology, back in those days, we were all required to take a class. Did you have to take one, Mary? You, didn't, you got lucky because we all had to take a class in psychology and I kept putting my hand up going, so how do you, how do you fix that? And the doctor that was teaching the class said, well, you don't. You just give them pills. You medicate them. And so we went through all these the classic crazy people stuff. And he'd say, and he worked at one of the big mental hospitals where people live for the rest of their life. He said, well, you give them pills so they don't hurt themselves. They don't hurt other people. So then we started looking at what happy people were like, and happy people are grateful. And happy people have an activity that they can be lost in. And, so, and I'm sure it's the psychologists that coined the phrase, they're in the zone. Now if I say to Rob and Mary, 
Do you get in the zone when you play? Rob's going to know exactly what I'm talking about because two days after a psychologist talked about being in the zone, musicians went, well, yeah, yeah. What, this is new? You just figured this out? So when you, listen, you watch, we have a bunch of musicians in here today. It's, it's, uh, somebody commented on that Thursday night at meditation that this center has, is top heavy with musicians, which it is. And the, the, the problem that I pointed out today is, is not that musicians don't experience samadhi. They do experience samadhi. But, you know, people that make quilts experience samadhi. And people that are really good cooks, like our head monk, he gets in there and he's got the stuff flying in the walk and all of this kind of stuff. He's in samadhi. Experiencing samadhi is not the problem. Losing the experience is the problem. Because once you stop playing, and then life rushes back into you, whatever you're doing, whatever your activity is, if your activity, I get lost in the garden. I'm out there pulling weeds and I just disappear. That's what happens in samadhi. We disappear. But once we stop the activity that we're doing, then we're back. Okay? Whatever unhappiness or discontent is in our life rushes back into us. And we realize, oh, I'm not where I should be at this stage. I love this one. I'm not where I should be at this age in my life. <laughs> I find that hysterical. You know? No, actually, you're exactly where you should be at this stage in your life. Wherever that is. It may not make you very happy, but that's exactly where you belong. Because oak trees cannot get up and move. Only in, in children's tales, the trees get up and walk around. The rest of the time, they're stuck right there. If it doesn't rain, they get sick. If it rains too much, they get sick. But they're right there all the time. So I like to point out one of my favorite topics when talking about music is singing in a chorus. And Susan, of course, who has a wonderful voice, for years sang in a chorus. And Susan wasn't there this morning. She was setting up our little camera for that. Uh, when I talked about that, I, I have a firm belief that one of the greatest activities people can do, see, I love to sing. If I'm given a choice between playing the guitar and singing, I'll sing any time. <clears throat> and to sing in a chorus is, becomes a true as in experience. To sing by yourself is pretty good. You can get in the zone. To sing in a chorus is to get in a zone at hyperspeed, you know, because you have to pay attention. You are now an oak tree in a forest. And when you sing in a chorus, I, uh, I have a baritone voice, but I was always a bass, because there are very few real basses floating around. So when you have a chorus and you have men, if they're a baritone, if they're a lone baritone, they always become the bass part. And I remember the first time I sang in a chorus in a church choir. And I had got a person standing on either side of me, and they knew what they were doing. And I didn't know how to read music. I mean, I, I saw the note went up. I mean, you know, I had a, a real rudimentary understanding that if the note went up, my voice was supposed to go up. But I was listening to them. And to sing in a chorus is to not only have to pay 100% of pay attention to what you're doing. You have to pay attention to everybody else. Because the minute you only pay attention to yourself, you're out of, you're out of step. You've either lost the rhythm or you've lost the tone and all of a sudden you stand out. So it's an exercise in paying attention. It's an exercise in being part of a group. It's an exercise in being part of a forest. So when I was young, I would join choirs. When I went to the army, I joined the choir on Sunday just so I could sing. I wasn't a Christian. I was a Buddhist, <laughs> but I joined the choir so I could sing. And they were ecstatic because I was the only man in the choir. So that was a real challenge because I had to figure out what the part actually sounded like without it hearing it. The problem is church is over with and you go home, and you're driving home, and the world rushes in on you. And you no longer have the forest to listen to. 
I had, to, I had a very fortunate seven years that I played in a community orchestra. And it's exactly the same thing. You have to listen to everyone around you. you there are no soloists in an orchestra. They bring a soloist in, and they get up and do whatever they want to do. But everybody in that orchestra has to play together, and they have to listen to each other. You know, and if, if the first start going a little too fast because they're not paying attention to the conductor, the seconds have to respond. Matter of fact, the whole orchestra has to respond. So the oak tree in the garden, it looks like it's alone, but somewhere, maybe over a, a wall or a fence, is another tree. And that's us. So our task in our practice is to maintain that mind that we have when we're in a choir or when we're in an orchestra or when we're sitting in our kitchen playing a song and we drop into the zone, okay? And now we're doing everything right. And here's the interesting thing. Even if we do it wrong, we're doing it 